Hello, and welcome to the Invigor Medical Podcast. I'm Natalie Garland. I'm here with Derek Berkey. How are you this morning, Derek? Doing great. How are you doing, Natalie? I'm fantastic. The sun is shining. I just got back from Mexico last week, so coming back to anything gray is like, wah, wah. <laughs> so as soon as the sun came out today, it's just like, boop, I'm up, I'm moving. It's fantastic. I love it. That's amazing. Uh, it also helps me when I know we have a really fun uh, podcast guest to um, interview, and I'm really excited about this one. You know, I'm a mother, you're a father, and so... Uh, talking with our guest today is going to be really exciting because um, we're both parents and we both try to stay fit and healthy, and that's what um, our guest is all about. Yeah. Um, so we're super excited to welcome today uh, Dr. Anthony Balduzzi, who's a passionate advocate for family health and wellness. Uh, Dr. Balduzzi, or Dr. A, Dr. Anthony, as we've now learned, founded the Fit Father and Fit Mother Project. Um, they're initiatives that are dedicated to helping parents lead healthier, more fulfilling lives. I'm all about that. That's such a struggle, trying to measure and balance and weigh all these things out. So so, Dr. Anthony, we're so excited to have you this morning. Welcome to the Invigor Medical Podcast. I am super happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh my gosh, we're stoked too. Yeah. I know that you um, have your own podcast as well, so I think it's always super fun when we have a guest on who is very used to this environment and this setting. Um, it's it's wonderful to always interview experts and people who are passionate about what they do, but there's always a bit of a different energy that happens when it's someone who's used to being on the mic like this. So I'm excited for that aspect of it. Yeah, I'm super <laughs> excited as well. Actually, in uh, I didn't say this at the beginning, Dr. Anthony, but I've actually followed your work for a couple of years now, and I've I've loved all the content you've put out. It's it's absolutely amazing. So let me just say it's an honor to have you on the show. That makes me so happy to hear. That is really cool. Thank you. So so that being said, I'm familiar with kind of your whole story, but uh, can you tell us, uh, let our listeners know kind of like how the Fit Father Project came about and and uh, how you how you got here today? For sure, it, it really started in my childhood. Growing up, I had I was born in Syracuse, New York on the East Coast, and I had a like a largely average childhood in terms of just like I remember playing outside with my little brother, having fun. What was unique about my childhood, though, is I watched my dad's health deteriorate massively. Like many guys, he basically busted his butt to provide for the family, and he put his health on the back burner. And when I was three, he fell over and had a grand mal seizure, and we took him to the hospital. It was one of the scariest things to see my dad like writhing on the floor, looking so helpless. And like in my mind at that time, it was like this dad, this is my superhero. This is my dad. Like what's going on? And being and so that was young. the night he actually, right? Yeah, for sure. And he received his uh, terminal brain cancer diagnosis. So imagine that, like being a young dad, having two kids, me with three, my little brother just born uh, and realizing that, you know, your life has changed forever. And he did everything he could, right? brain surgery that basically they cut his skull open. This was like many years ago. The technology has come a long way, removed a large chunk of his brain, chemotherapy, radiation. He lost control over half of his body. And so I got to see firsthand as a child what it looks like when you have a parent who loses their health and vitality that wants to do better, but didn't have the full strength and energy in, to show up. Um, and eventually, you know, this went on, the cancer came back after many years and my dad died when he was 42 years old. Oh, I'm so and sorry. I was, I was nine at the time. And devastating to, to witness that, like an absolute hole was ripped open in my heart where, you know, I just had so much pain and, and anger and confusion questions for God about why did this happen? But there was also like a fire that started to burn in there as well about like, man, I just realized one of the greatest lessons of life at a young age that like as parents, health is the foundation of our lives, of what we love. Because if that goes, we lose everything. I saw it happen to my dad. He lost his ability to make memories with our family, to go to work, which he actually did legitimately enjoy, to pursue his hobbies and passions and to be there with us. And he didn't want to die, but he did. And so I was able to channel that pain when my mom gave me a pair of my dad's old dumbbells. And this was like several months later. And I started to train. I hid him under my bed and every night I'd pull him out and do little exercises. I didn't know exactly what I was doing, but I saw people do curls and push-ups and squats. And I started to train. And as I started to train, what was really fascinating to me, it was I started to feel better internally, like that sadness I had started to feel like it was turning into a bit of strength and control. And I was starting to understand that, wow, when I do things with my body and I become strong, I feel better. And I started to exert my will and I began to heal. I began to heal mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and I got physically stronger. And that drove me in over the next 10, 15 years to really study fitness and nutrition. I stopped eating birthday cake because I thought it was too sugary. I was like, <laughs> the kid that was just like so dedicated. That kid. <laughs> yeah, that kid. In high school, I packed my own lunch and carried around a water bottle. And I was just like, I just knew health was really important for my healing and on deep levels. And I became 
very passionate about the fitness side. I began competing in bodybuilding and that was a very interesting period of my life because it's all about getting yourself to look as good as possible and train really hard. And you learn a lot of valuable things, but I also in the process developed a psychology and ego where I was putting my own body on a pedestal. It was the thing that I was worshiping and designing my whole life around. And then in my final year of medical school, I had a very big wake up call. I, with that same ego that drove me through the fitness and the training, I, I took that onto the skiing slopes with a friend. We were taking a long weekend away just to blow off some steam and we're both very good skiers. And I had an intuition this day that I needed to slow down, but I completely ignored it. And I was skiing really fast and I was going down a run where I was doing a jump in the air. And as I jumped in the air, like I, there was a moment where you're like, uh oh, like this is not going well. My skis are crossing a little bit. And when I land on the ground going about 30 miles per hour, my skis just blow off. Oh, so I'm geez. head over head over foot, just tumbling, tumbling oh, no. somewhere in there, snap my arm and then slam into a tree going about 30 miles per hour. My right leg explodes into six pieces. Oh, oh my, my God. Goodness. So I am like in the bottom of this tree. Well, I'm in my late twenties now like wiggling my fingers and my toes being like, am I dead? Like, am I paralyzed? My knee is backwards and sideways. And then the pain hits, right? The most excruciating pain of my life, you know, floods me. And I, in that moment, I'm like, I literally almost just killed myself like earlier than my dad died from my own decisions <laughs> and my ego. And this began uh, the next phase of kind of like my progression healing journey into health and fitness to learn how to like regrow my body, regrow a leg. I went through six reconstructive surgeries over six years, stem cells, all of the stuff. And, and, and to basically, and also healed myself emotionally and spiritually to understand the health is so much beyond just tending to the physical body, but it's also relating to our bodies through the different stages. It woke me up with empathy. It woke me up with a greater sense of purpose and then, you know, I became a dad through that period of time as well. And, and it just it's deepened why I'm so connected to health, because our bodies certainly are these body vehicles through which we experience our life journeys. And as parents, the quality of our body and our energy is ultimately transmitted to our kids. It sets culture for our families. It gives us longevity. And these bodies can be amazing learning vehicles for our mental, physical and spiritual growth and development. And I learned that so much. So that's why I'm passionate about this conversation that's beyond just like, how do dads and moms over 40, like improve hormones or exercise or make time for that? Like, that's important because that's like the art of implementing a health routine to create results. And we're world, world class at that. We've had roughly 100,000 families run through our programs in Fit Father, Fit Mother and create life changing transformations. But I'm also passionate about this idea of how we connect more deeply to our health and why it's important so that we can have a really profound healing journey in the process. I love that. I think that's so impactful because I know for me personally in my in my fitness journey over the years, you know, it's one thing to just like have the willpower uh, to just go and do the workout and you know, what's this what's my size? You know, how much am I lifting? How much am I weighing? How are my clothes fitting? Focusing on all of that. But as I've gotten older, you know, and I and I have two kids like we talked about earlier and you know, I'm a single mom and working, it makes it much more difficult because I know how to do that. But finding the time and squeezing it in. And so for me, over the last couple of years, focusing in on, um, I remember I was going through a, a kind of tough time uh, physically and mentally. I was actually going through a health issue I wasn't even aware of. And I was really struggling to get into the gym. And so I made the one single focus of getting into the gym. Like the only reason I'm doing this is for my mental health mm -hmm. and made it only about that. And it was amazing the difference that I saw because then it wasn't, because otherwise it was about what kind of workout am I getting in? And am I lifting enough? And, you know, is it hit? Is it, you know, is it the barbell? Is it all of these different things? And instead I could celebrate that I went for a 30 minute walk. Mm -hmm. And it, and it, and, but that actually ended up doing this switch for me that made it so that I was more likely to get in and do the heavy lift that I wanted to do, which is incredible. Mm -hmm. So I love, I love this, this holistic approach that you're taking to this because I think it's so important. And, and, you know, as parents, I think we beat ourselves up about so much and not taking care of our physical and mental health is just one more thing to add to the list, right? So I'm yeah. really curious, like, how did the idea for these, you know, projects come about and what are some of the initial challenges that you faced in, in launching Fit Father and Fit Mother? For sure. And I, I think, you know, as I got very passionate about my own health, fitness and healing, when I was in medical school, I saw so many people come in that were just a lot like my dad. They didn't always have cancer diagnoses. It was often heart disease, pre-diabetes, diabetes, chronic inflammation, issues with arthritis, and they just struggled to find a way 
to have a sustainable health and fitness plan, to get the mindset aligned, the right daily routines, and to make it practical for busy parents. So I started to develop like my methodologies to, to teach people in the medical front. And then I started to package those in a way that would be accessible for every mom and dad who wanted to improve their health and fitness amidst the chaos of busy lives. So it, it really has been a powerful mission of my own healing journey. And also in memory of my dad and service of my dad and what I went through to help other parents get through that. And something you said was pretty interesting. And I think one of the one of the ways that we go about this process of helping people through this is actually not to start with nutrition or exercise. Like that's the thing you place you think you need to start. But most parents who struggle, they struggle because they don't have the right psychology, neuro associations and mindset, which is the basis of our ability to sustain change. Because like we can give any monkey a plan of something to do and they could do it for a period of time. But if, if there's not this emotive, connected neural network of reasons to connect to your health and, and do it, then you're going to fizzle out eventually in time because there's friction and you don't have that motion, mo emotional buy-in. So you did that nice uh, psychological gymnastics of reframing why you exercise, and then it actually became more aligned and easier to get into. We help our clients do that through a process of some deep reflection and journaling. Now, a lot of the things we hear from people before they start is, oh, I don't have the time to exercise or things like this. Where does that thought come from? That thought comes from a fundamental fallacy that you believe that your health is one circle over here and the rest of your life is something else. And these are two things that you can manage where the, the truth is we have these bodies and it's one thing. We help people collapse that down because anywhere you take your body, whatever you're doing, whether it's work, parenting, improving your finances, doing hobbies, you you're here in this body vehicle and the quality of the energy your neurotransmitters, how, how good you feel with, you, with your confidence in your body is affecting every experience that you have. So it's one game. So if we can understand that and then also look at our core values, what do we want to do? Financially abundant, spiritually connected, great parent, happy and pursuing great travel and experiences. How does your health relate to all of those? And we go through people, a, con a, a really conscious journaling and reflection exercise to make those connections, understand the costs of what happens if we don't make a change, understand what we're willing to do to make the change, why it's so important. And we culminate in writing a mission statement. And I got to say, this is just such important foundational work because without this, you're just following these plans where people eventually fall off track and it's not really a deep, deep journey. And it needs to be a deep journey because that's what creates sustainability. That's incredible. Yeah. I, I love that idea. And it's such a different kind of approach because you're right. You'll see People, you know, it's like they finally get motivated. And I'm excited because this episode will be airing, you know, right into the new year when so many people are starting these new programs. And it's like, and and I often wonder, it's like, you know, people get started and they do well for a little while and then they fall off. But the reason they're able to start is because there's this mindset and mentality of this is the time to get started. Mm -hmm. And this is the time that I'm going to make this work. And so every year it rolls around, but then it falls off. Right. But that is a mindset and a mentality. And so I'm excited for the timeliness of this episode for people to hear Definitely. it and to think about, I mean, what a crazy idea that I've never would have thought about a journaling exercise for a health and fitness program. Like it's and, pivotal. I, yeah. Yeah. And I'm just really curious, like what kind of led you into that idea of like, this needs to be where we start. The human experience. We don't make decisions strictly because of our logical mind. We make decisions because we have a deep unconscious, subconscious, emotional quality to everything we're doing. In a sense, we have a brain and a nervous system that's wired to move us towards pleasure and away from pain. And so we need to be able to connect the behaviors that we want to do to pleasure. So like we have pleasure in our values and how do we make sure that we get the health routine synced up to that so it's more likely. It's just like how the human experience is designed. We need to have emotions tied with clarity in the plan, supported by a healthy environment. Those are the three aspects you need to have. And a lot of health programs are working on improving your environment and giving you a clear plan, but not aligning with that emotive quality. There's a really powerful psychologist um, named, named of Jonathan Haidt, and he has this analogy of the elephant, the rider, and a path. And it basically, if you let me explain this, helps understand how we make any kind of behavioral change. Effectively, the way our brain is structured, we have the newer areas of that neocortex, the higher executive functions that can plan and reason. That's where we can chart a course or a goal or have some kind of like vision for where we want to go and come up with a strategy. But we have that deeper interior area that is the limbic system. That's like our elephant, this giant beast that if it does not want to move or it wants to go in a different direction because we have unprocessed traumas, because we, we're not aligned on certain kinds of things, I don't care how, how good that rider on top says, go right, go right. If elephant goes left, everything goes left. 
So we got to get these two synced up and working together. We got to bring emotion into the health and fitness aspect to get it aligned and then create a clear plan with the rider to be like, this is what you're going to do. It's sustainable. It works for your family. And then ideally the path is pretty clear. Like, can we remove the logs and the rocks? These are things like cleaning out your home, getting you connected to powerful, healthy community around you, making it so you have a nice real turnkey way to get the exercise and workouts in, helping you do meal prep and things like this to reduce friction and nutrition plan. That's like paving the path. You get these, these three elements working, you are successful. If you miss any one of those, you're going to fail. Like if you have unhealthy food in the house and unsupportive people, even if you want to change and you, and you have a clear plan, it's not going to work. So you can imagine any of those elements are missing and, and it's hosed from the beginning. So this can be applied to any kind of success, but it's just very salient when it comes to health and fitness change. You know, that, that gets me thinking about, um, this concept that I'm familiar with it, it, the, the connection between the prefrontal cortex and the limbic system. Um, yes. I can't remember exactly who said this, but I have this kind of model in my mind of, the way that you connect those two parts of your brain, those two different types of thinking is by building a narrative, like, because mm -hmm. us as human beings, we're very much story driven, yes. story motivated, uh, beings. And so the way that you connect logical progression of events and emotions is those, those things tied together is a story like, yes. And so by following a beat. And so if you can through journaling and through kind of like writing your mission and through saying like, this is what I want to do. It, it, it's just, you build so much more resilience, right? Because yes. it's, it, you know, let's say that you do screw up and you're like, oh, you know, you go out and you eat too much pizza or, you know, you eat a Twinkie cause you're at the, at the, at the, uh, gas station and it just looks appealing and you eat it that you, you're, if you have this narrative, if you're, if you're just looking at it from like a logical point of view of like, well, I've got to do X, Y, and Z, it's very easy to see that as like an on off switch. And if one it mistake is. and you're off the, and you're off the, the, mm -hmm. the bandwagon, right. But if, if you yes. really get the story of like, this is the type of person I want to be. In fact, uh, Dr. Brett Burton, who we, oh, whose yeah. episode just recently aired, um, talked a lot about this where it's like, if you're able to tell yourself, I am a healthy person that does healthy things and you're able to buy that narrative, you're so much more likely to be flexible when, when things come your way. Mm. Um, so I, I love this approach that, that dear, that you're talking about, cause it, it gives, not just, it, it's just, it's so much more holistic and, and really encompasses the whole picture. Yeah, for sure. And let's frame this even deeper. Like we have the, we have the concept of the hero's journey, like through myth, like Joseph Campbell kind of stuff. Like, let's talk about like Lord of the Rings movie. Many of us have seen. Imagine if, imagine if Frodo, the first time you put on the ring and the ring wraiths came and almost killed them all was like, oh damn, I, I blew it. <laughs> I guess the, I guess the mission's over. Not like, for me guys. I'm going back to the dryer. Sorry, <laughs> and turned around. It wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a great story and it, it wouldn't work. And I think if we create this greater frame that like this purpose of this, this path of getting healthy and then continuing on is a hero's journey. That's deep, that greater frame around it that has a narrative and story that connects your health to your family, that connects your health to how you like to spend your time to your highest, deepest values. For me, I connect my health to my feelings of spirituality and internal alignment. Like these are deep motivations. And that's not to say you don't still have this outer lay of, of physical, uh, I want to look a certain way, be perceived a certain way. Like that's good. That's part of the picture. It's not bad, but it's, there's like layers to the young and you want to go deep on this. And then you can get away from the all or nothing black and white thinking. Then you can get away of thinking that I don't have enough time to do this. It's like, it's imperative. This is how I tend to my body. And now you're moving in the right path. And the, the, the guests that you shared about with doing the positive affirmations, I think that's important stuff and it's very helpful and can be a part of like retraining the, the mindset, doing new, more positive associations and statements. But ultimately the transformation happens in the daily dojo in you actually like getting this emotive power, taking the actions through behavior change, and then starting to see the effects. And that is a, you're really creating new neural grooves as you're releasing physical weight, you're changing emotional weight is coming off too. And new patterns are being laid down. It is a process. And I'm here to tell you the cool thing is like for a parent who's out of shape, you can do it in six to 12 months. You might've been unhealthy for like 20 years. But in six to 12 months, you can rewire your psychology, get however much weight you want to lose off. And I can say this with confidence because we help so many people do that in that time frame. Yeah. I, for, I, I want to just have a little sidebar here for a moment and just say, hey, we're sitting here talking and I'm thinking how cool it is. Um, kind of all these pillars that you have that bring you in this place, right? Like you're, you're, you're not just a personal trainer, like you're also... A, a doctor and you also have this own personal experience of trauma because I know you mentioned earlier about what are the kind of these roadblocks that we're facing and it could be trauma that you've experienced because these are things mm -hmm. that people don't really think about when putting together 
a, a fitness plan or a health and nutrition plan um, for their future. It's not really something that that comes to mind when people are thinking of these things. So I I just I just kind of was thinking that as we were talking, and I wanted to bring that up because I think you're you're able to offer a perspective that a lot of people aren't, and um, the passion that you're bringing to it is uh, for me, it's contagious. Like I feel hyped, like I'm ready. I'm yeah, ready to seriously. go, you I know? That. Yeah. Well, look, food is one of our main ways that we're going to change our state and respond to stress. Like we just, we, we get the same kind of neurochemistry when we take drugs and we eat sugar. And ultimately when people are feeling like they're not eating healthy or they're not doing healthy behaviors, they're doing something to cope with a feeling of pressure or wanting to change their state. The healthy people, the people that are consistent and have good physiques and bodies and habits, like they also have those same stresses and pressures. Now, they may relate to them in a, in a slightly different way, but they certainly have healthier outlets and mechanisms. Like they go into the gym and they use that for their mental health. They use healthier meals to change their neurochemistry. So ultimately, we're all going to be kind of coping and managing. I just help people create this background of a, of a default healthier system that works, that's low on friction, because if you have a lot of friction in your plan, ultimately, it's going to hit the rails. And then you work it in the dojo and you start to change. I'm thinking as you're talking, another thing, um, I think it's easy to do this comparison game, right? If you're not somebody that's on this track for taking good care of your body and your mental health and whatever, and you see these other people and you say like, well, if they can do it, why can't I do it? Right. And you kind of start to do this equalizer. And on one hand, it's like, yes, we are all, all the same. You know, there's to a degree, the same capabilities that we have. But one thing that I'm thinking is how much our experiences impact us. Mm. And as we're talking about our mental framework and our trauma and the stories we tell ourselves and how that keeps us from being in something like this. I think about people that I know for think, you know, being on a fitness journey and being fit and taking care of themselves and taking care of their mental health is just something that just clicks. Like they're just, you know, they work hard at it, but at the same time, it's never really been a struggle for them. Whereas other people, it's like, it's, it's ne they've never even been able to get started or they get started and they fall off and they get started and they fall off. And so I'm curious if you could speak to how much does that play a role and, you know, people that seem to be able to just fly and go and they're doing amazing versus people that really struggle to get started. Is that some, is that really what we're talking about? Is that internal story and, and reframing the mind? Yeah, I think it, it could be internal story. It could be the struggle is rooted in some kind of fundamental challenge that's been going on for a long period of time, blew out your knee in high school, feel like you can't exercise, stack it up. A lot of it is due to bandwidth and how your life is set up and the amount of stress and busyness that you have is like, is a big factor, let alone like and layered on the fact that the body goes through this trajectory in your forties, fifties, sixties for women and men, where your hormones change, you can't get away with doing the same things you used to do. It's easier to gain weight, harder to lose weight. So you almost need to be more dialed in, in a sense, to be able to, to succeed in this. So it's, it's super multifactorial and, and I'll offer this perspective. We all have areas of our lives where we feel naturally competent and it goes pretty easy for us. There could be someone who is overweight listening to this, who absolutely crushes it in finances. And there may be somebody who is, you know, really healthy, physically fit that can't find a way to really provide for themselves and, and get the career thing. So I think to recognize that we all have our strengths and weaknesses to lean into the fact that wherever we're really struggling. And if, as long as we feel an internal call to improve that area, that is the exact path of our lives forward. Like it is ours to do. If we're being called into this and it's a deficit, that is how we grow into a more complete whole person. Because the word health literally comes from the old Germanic that means wholeness. And we have this sense when we are fulfilled in our work, have deep connections in relationships, have good health, and the, all these areas are, and we're contributing to the world, we feel whole, like this whole sphere of us is like expressed and great. When we have deficits, that's the exact stuff to lean into for our personal progression. It, it is what, a, what we should take up the real big charge and stand and like move into it with even more energy and vigor because it's ours to do. So that's the empowering perspective of the experience of the deficit. It's what we can fill in, and that's where we're going to get our best lessons and gains. Your future gains are not going to happen really in an area that you're already really good at. It's just icing on the cake, yeah. you know, right. running the same play. It's the stuff that we feel deficit in that we're going to grow. And what's so cool about the body is all of us eventually die. Health is <laughs> so great. Cool. Like so all cool. of us, all of us eventually lay these bodies down. Our skin eventually dehydrates and gets wrinkly. We eventually get it so we can't squat the amount of weight we used to. So it's this beautiful trajectory of surrender that comes in. 
here. So while we still have these bodies, let's use them as vehicles for our, our deep development. Uh, and, and, and that's where I think you're getting here. You're getting mental, emotional, physical, spiritual development through the process of getting healthy and then staying healthy. It's, it's phenomenal how deep this really is. Yeah, that's incredible. You know, as, as that last thought that you shared of like, we are, we are all headed to the same spot, right? We're all headed towards death that it, you know, no one's going to escape it. Um, it reminds me of uh, a book that I read recently by Peter Atia Outlive. I don't know if you're familiar with Peter Atia and his work. Yeah, yeah um, I absolutely love it. This concept that he talks about and he has talked about for a very long time is this uh, divide between lifespan versus health span. Mm -hmm. And kind of like his whole purpose is to try to help people to um, increase their health span, which is essentially like how long you can live while still being healthy. Um, and so it, it by focusing on on like physical fitness and, and, and it's not just physical fitness because just like you said health is not just like how your body reacts it's also like mental health he has a whole uh, chapter dedicated to that in this book um so i guess my question for you is like how, what what can our listeners do specifically like if they if they want to get started now and they want to actually say um you know let's say that they've taken the time to actually like said okay this is my why this is what i really this is what's driving me what are some of the like foundational things that they can do to actually start increasing their health span so that way they can live uh, better and fuller lives as they age love it we're about to get practical here <laughs> there is there is an order of importance when it comes to creating health change there are some things that are just more fundamental to do first than others the good news is exercise is not first on this list it is a couple steps down the first thing is outside of the mindset and deep work we've done is you need to create your version of a sustainable, healthy nutrition plan, because food is one of those unique things where it's either poisonous for the body, like truly creating inflammation, blood sugar dysregulation, hormonal issues, or it's literally healing and creating blood sugar stability, insulin sensitivity, consistent energy and weight loss. So it, you need to get that baseline default plan in because that's ultimately what you're going to be working every single day. And if you don't have that layer in and you're trying to exercise, you're not eating great, but you're trying to go work out, you're putting stress in a system on top of a poor baseline mechanism that's creating damage and inflammation. And I, we do know, at least from Peter Atia's work, he's like huge on the fact that inflammation is at the root of disease. Yeah. Looking at like cardiovascular health is really foundational and food is either inflammatory or anti-inflammatory. And I have my own take on what kinds of foods and diets are best, and we can certainly get into that. But before getting into the foods and like the religion side of nutrition, where it's like, this is best, that is best. It's most important to think of it in terms of like the structure and the routine. So every person here, I wish for them to develop a proactive meal timing schedule where they have a plan and they're eating proactively every single day. And it could be something like the classic breakfast, lunch, snack, dinner, like eight noon, snack at three, dinner at six. That's fine. It could be intermittent fasting where you either have early breakfast and early dinner, or you shift that breakfast back and have it maybe at like 10, 11, a snack and dinner at five or six. But the structure is super important to nail in because every day the mind is going to be able to latch on to something that no matter what happened yesterday, I have this routine and structure to guide back on. It's kind of like how an airplane flies, like the nutrition structure is the guardrails that keeps you like on track and gives you something to execute on. And it's far less nebulous than like, what kind of foods should I necessarily eat? It's like, when am I eating? And it gets a formulaic. And there's a lot of benefit that happens when you do have these more formulaic nutrition structures, your blood sugar ends up being more stable. You tend not to overeat. You start to get out of that reactive. Oh, I missed a meal. And then, oh, I'm really hungry. Or I got the snack stuff because I didn't eat. And then I overeat in dinner. Then I feel guilty. Those are the cycles that run when people don't have a proactive structure in place. And with that, go ahead. Please. I was just going to say to touch on that, I'm kind of curious, uh, what is your take on like calorie counters or like macro trackers or things along those lines? Like, are you for them or against them? I I'm for them for people that have analytical personalities and want to track those things. They're absolutely not necessary, but they can be very helpful. And this is also why we need to literally tailor our approach to this stuff to our natural personality and dispositions. If you are data driven and that really motivates you to have the super clarity on the, the macros and the calorie tracking and using an app, then that is probably the path forward for you to succeed. But you can also use some heuristics in terms of meal setup that I'll share with you that pretty much can get you to eat a calorie balanced, roughly around 2000 to 2500 calorie uh, day, break, breaking down into like 600 calorie meals that are healthy and easy, and you don't need to necessarily count. So not necessary, but helpful for personality types. Now, 
when we're doing nutrition, we're also balancing these forces of consistency and variety. We want to be consistent because it makes it easier. There's less thinking involved. There's less friction, but we also need some variety because no one wants to just eat like chicken and broccoli for the rest of their lives. Like there's <laughs> no you. fun in that, right? It's unsustainable. Yeah. Now, the beginning part of the day for busy parents is the consistent time. Like every person who wants to succeed long term that I've that I've talked to, like they pretty much have a go to meal number one. The first breakfast, it's it's like it could be one or two different options, but it's standardized, it's healthy food, and it's easy to do turnkey every single day. It works with your families if you have young, young kids. So examples of this could be some kind of egg based recipe with avocado or eggs with berries. Um, it could be like a power smoothie protein thing. It could be overnight oatmeal with some protein additives in there, but it's something that you don't need to think about that can help turn this gear every single day that this is how I start my day. This is how I start my day. And that's the purification process of nutrition because positive momentum begets more positive momentum. That's just how we work when it comes to healthy foods. You eat healthier, you're more likely to exercise. You exercise, you're more likely to eat healthier. And so the nutrition lever is a powerful thing to pull every morning. And we're huge fans of that. And prior to that, what we actually like to have people do is when they wake up pretty much within the first 10 minutes of waking up is to drink 20 to 32 ounces of water. Ideally, you add some minerals to that for the good health benefits of those. And that is so much more than just the physical benefits of that it's a rehydration. It's literally almost like a prayer or an affirmation. First thing in the day, it's like, you throw that back, you feel some gratitude and you're like, today I'm starting my day with something so helpful and simple for my body. And it's like a blessing that helps the rest of the day go on It's a behavioral hook. So imagine having the water, then into a standardized meal number one. And I, I recommend lunch is even kind of consistent too. This could be leftovers from your healthiest dinner the night before. It could be a protein bowl. It could be a healthy sandwich on some organic sprouted bread if you tolerate wheat fine. Uh, it could be getting healthy meal out at like Chipotle or a local place that has some healthy options if you eat out lunch and you're in the office kind of scenario. But like having those decided go-to options where you remove the cognitive load is essential for those first couple meals of the day to keep this habit momentum. And dinner is the place where you can have more variety. Build it around some kind of protein. You can have some healthy carbohydrates. I'm, I, I'm not a believer that you need to go a super low carb, but I am a believer that you want to lower your carbs when you're getting healthy to improve glucose and insulin sensitivity. Um, and, and you use this framework. This is like kind of high level and we can go as specific as you want. It can really help you make this more of a lifestyle than a diet. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Cause I mean, uh, it really depends on what, what type of workouts you're doing as well. Cause just like you were saying, like the, the habits are synergistic with each other. You know, your diet mm -hmm. feeds your, your lifestyle or your workouts and your workouts then like feedback into your nutrition. So like someone who's just doing like, let's say low rep bodybuilding type mm -hmm. of workouts, they might not be hitting the carbs as high because they're not doing as intensive workouts, yes. but they are, you know, really maximizing their protein versus someone who's doing marathons or is wanting yeah. to really go on like long runs, those carbs for are sure. incredibly important for them to be able to yes. maintain that level of energy. So I think, I think that's an absolutely fantastic point to be made. Well, overall, I'm loving that your approach is so it's not cookie cutter because yeah. I think, you know, people try one kind of diet or exercise plan and then fail. And then they, then they go and they still try another one. And it's like, they're trying to find the one kind of thing. And I kind of accidentally fell into a few years back, like during COVID doing some like health and fitness coaching on the side, just like with friends mm -hmm. and family who were like, Hey, we're, we're at home. We want to work out. Like, and I would just sit with people individually and be like, well, what are you going to actually stick with? And I'm not an expert, right. like near to the level where you are, but it feels really affirming to hear this from you because it, it just makes so much sense to me that really what matters is what are you going to stick with? Like, how does yes. your mind work? Like talking about, you know, counting calories and macros and like, cause I've done that at times, but ugh, like I'll get through like a week on my fitness pal logging. And then I'm like, man, I got to look this food up. And how much did I actually have? Like, I'm not waiting. Right? That's like, friction for you. It's I, someone else that might be fun, but for right. you it's friction. <laughs> at so yeah, much friction, perfect. like fire. Basically there was a fire happening yeah. from all the friction. <laughs> <laughs> so I am just absolutely loving that this is your approach. So like if someone were to call you up or go to your website, I, it sounds like you just have like step by step by step. So once you've like gone it's through this, it's a literal full process. Like step one, we get you through the mindset mission statement work. Step two, we explain the meal plan in six steps, like meal timing, schedule setup, deciding what your first meal is for meal one, go to getting lunch, healthy snacks, dinner recipes, like giving you perfect clarity and to kind of loop back our analogy. In step one with the mindset, we got the elephant really motivated to go in the direction we want to go. In step two, we give the rider clarity, both on the nutrition and on the 
exercise. And then in step three, we basically like pave the path, clean out the, the home, make sure it's easy to get the workouts and get you surrounded by community. And like, that's the process of like really repeatable behavior change. And the cool thing is you can actually tailor, the whole point is tailoring your unique preferences, how it works with your family, your different schedule into your plan, the least friction plan as possible. So your kids eat a certain thing for breakfast. How can you like tack on with that? So there's less friction in, in the morning family likes a certain kinds of things for dinner. You can adapt to make that the case. You may have some kind of cultural aspect to your food and you might eat plant-based for that reason. Then having recipes that work in that stage is going to be essential for your long-term success. It is about managing friction. It's not about like thinking short-term and, and then like, it can be as simple as this, like the best, healthiest foods for us are the whole non-processed foods, like the outside of the grocery store, the fruits, the vegetables, the meats, the fish, the eggs, like the basic non-box, non-processed stuff. And there's a subset of those foods in for every person that's uniquely very healthy. Like there's some people who react poorly to certain vegetables, some people who do better on higher carbs, lower on higher carbs. Part of that's genetics, part of that's your training. And the process is actually like going through this health journey to find and dial that in for you uniquely. And like what you get through this is I know my good baseline routine is the foods that make me feel great and you can still do free meals and cheat meals and it's all kind of built into this lifestyle and then you just work it. And look, there's going to be periods where you drift a little bit, but you have a plan to kind of drift on back and you're not thinking about some kind of rigid diet to follow. It's just a lifestyle and it also creates a culture for your kids too. And that's where this becomes about the fit family concept too, right? Where you're starting to eat healthier, your kids see you transforming. Not only do you get the benefit of a longer life for them, but they get the trickle down benefit of having a healthier parent and then healthier food choices at home. Because you look around, we have childhood obesity epidemic, like diabetes in kids that did not exist 100 years ago. It is, a, it is a product of our modern culture, right? And you never see an overweight kid without typically having some kind of overweight parents because they're eating those kinds of foods. They're not making the food decisions. So you want to set your kids up, right? I mean, it starts, it starts with you. Yeah. You know, you brought up that, the, the, that point of like the effect that parents have on their kids. And actually, I mean, that's kind of, that's kind of the whole purpose of the, of the fit father and fit mother project, right? Is, is the, you know, the mother and father is like central to that and how it affects your children. And something that got me thinking is my own, I guess, how could you say this? Like the parental or the fitness legacy that, that my, parents and grandparents have left before me, I was kind of reflecting on it. Um, my grandfather, like a couple months before he died, he actually hiked the, the, the Tetons. And <laughs> like, so cool. when I think about that, it, it, it inspires me of like, I, I can perform at that level. And I want to be able to leave that kind of legacy for mm -hmm. my kids as well. You know, my dad, um, you know, was an avid runner and, and still is, uh, fairly active. And, um, you know, my mom is very much into the strength scene. And so like, I, I think about these, the way that, that my legacy has, or the, like my parents' legacy has affected me and it inspires me to try and leave that also for my kids. Um, mm -hmm. and you know, like, I think that it's so important to, to consider the family because I, I, I can't think of anything more motivating than family, mm -hmm. right? Too, like yeah. leaving that type of legacy for my kids and, you know, like, at the same time, there's also nothing more challenging, in my opinion. Uh, like, uh, I was just talking to Natalie before the show started. We just recently had a, a new child essentially come into our life, and um, and it, it throws off the whole schedule. And it's very hard to, to kind of maintain all of the healthy habits. But in my mind, I know once this stabilizes, I know that I'm going to be right back at the gym and I'm going to be right back going back into my routine. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I guess my question for you is like uh, – what what is your legacy like what is your fitness legacy i mean obviously we have your father but i would be curious to hear more about if there's other people in your family or in your life that have affected you for sure and i'll say like I, I do believe the statement to be true that generational health is generational wealth because what happens when you have healthier kids meaning they have regulated blood sugars they have better attention and mood they're going to perform better in school they're going to be more confident they're going to be more expressed their intelligence will be greater when they have better neurochemistry happening because they're on a healthier routine and i think for kids it's going to be mostly getting them outside more feeding them good healthy foods and like limiting the disruption of the circadian rhythm with the technology and the non-native emf like that's kind of like the challenge that parents are navigating primarily with kids and if you can help fix that you can set your it up for a really wonderful trajectory. And if they're struggling, I, I would say it's okay too, because your kid now has the opportunity later in life to go through this hero's journey of healing too. And it all, it's all good in that sense. Right. Um, for me, 
What's most motivating is certainly like family and passing down healthy culture to my family, but it's also this, this feeling of internal alignment that I have where I'm congruent. I feel like I have integrity and wholeness when I'm speaking about these things. I'm also living them. I understand that health is created when I live in accordance with natural law, light and dark cycles, good sleep, natural foods, water. I think it's poetic that the earth is 70% water and so are our bodies that like plants, we need the sunshine on our skin and our eyes for proper neurochemistry and hormones that we need to breathe fresh air through our nose for the oxygen to work for our mitochondria. We need to be connected to this natural process. And if anything, modern life is getting us disconnected with it. So part of my, my, I guess my, my motivation is that alignment piece and bringing in the nature and just the understanding of natural law. And as it relates to what I feel here and called to do is, is to like to help wake people up to their own internal journey. I feel like I'm kind of like lighting little lamps when people come on, they establish their routine, and then they're a little bit of a locus of light in their family and community. And inherently, because light spreads, it's just the nature of light, it lights more lights. So there's kind of like a generative thing that kind of happens. And we're all doing this. You're doing this right now in this podcast, in this platform, it's lighting lights, it's lighting more lights. And I think that's how in a world that sometimes can seem a little bit stressful, a little bit dark, we do have personal power in our own story, in our own way to like create more light. So that's where this feels like it's more in the realm of like service and goodness of sharing the embodiment of what I'm into. And, and like, that's also super motivating for me. I love that. Um, and that's quite a legacy to leave behind. I was thinking myself, like I didn't really grow up with parents who were like very physically fit or active. So as you were saying that, I was like, oh, what is, you know, the legacy that I was left? But my mom was very into nutritional healing. Mm -hmm. Like we grew up always eating very healthy. And of course, as a kid, you're like, what kind of cereal is this mom? Like, or it's like oatmeal, cream of wheat, you know, also from a very large family. I'm the third oldest of 11 kids. So also it's wow. very budget friendly kinds of food. For sure. And I remember I, you know, I always grew up playing sports. I was an athlete. I, you know, I got married at 18 and moved out of the house and quickly put on 50 pounds because I didn't have that safety net of this is the food that's in the house that's going to eat. And I'm like, woo, let's go. I can eat whatever I want. And, right. you know, of course, very quickly felt the effects of that. And so, but it was really great because I was able to fall back on this knowledge that my mom had given me about what is healthy food. And I had, I really got to build on that with other types of like understanding what food is doing in the body, but she really laid the foundation for me on being curious about food and on having food. And that's something that I'm now trying to pass on to my children as well. That's and fantastic. Here's what I want to say on that. It's like, okay, so you're going to eat every day regardless. Let's say you're on the standard three meals per day, seven meals per week. That's like 21 meals. Like those meals that you're going to do regardless because it, you have a default plan in place are either going to be creating dysregulation of blood sugar, lower energy, more addictive patterns, or they're going to be give you sustainable energy, feeling of alignment, greater clarity. So what I want to help people do is understand it actually can give you more time if you go through the process of upgrading that default mode. And you're going to pick the healthy foods you actually love and putting them into that slot. So now you have a best in slot. And if life gets busy, this is a really important thing that you shared earlier is like, it's okay and natural for some things to fall off the bandwagon. Like if your energy and bandwidth is taxed, busy season and work, something happens with family, family expands with more kids, exercise is always the thing to go. And that is okay. That does not mean that you need to throw the nutrition out the window and the daily movement. We look at the longest living people around the planet, the centenarians, those pockets of longevity, they are not doing P90X. They don't, right? They're not. But what they are doing is they're outside, they're walking, they're eating natural whole base foods, they're getting the sunshine, they're surrounded by family. We can still mimic these things even in busy seasons. So imagine having this more upgraded, not perfect, but 75% better healthy routine that you can run in the, in the business of life. Maybe you can't train your butt off right now. Maybe you're not sleeping quite enough, but like you're still doing like a vast majority of things and it's okay to maintain in some periods and then gain in other periods. It's the natural cycles. Again, natural law. We don't have spring all year. There is winter time. There is storage. There is breakdown. And then we come back through this, this cycle. And I guess giving ourselves the grace of that large, larger perspective is an important part for sustainability. Otherwise, you're stuck in the rigid. I must be perfect. It must be that way. And anything in nature that's too rigid gets snapped up. Things that are strong and stable, but kind of flexible, those are the things that survive. Palm trees would not be here right now if they couldn't yield and bend. Yeah, yeah definitely. I think also the grace of like, 
I think sometimes as a parent, it's hard because you feel like you need to be pouring everything into your children or into your work and like the life that you're building for them. And I think there's a grace in um, pouring into yourself, like saying it's okay to do this for myself. And something I've noticed over the years is how much of a better mom I am when I am feeding myself correctly, when I am getting movement, when I am working out, when I am getting time as an adult away from my kids and my work for myself to do fun things, I'm a better mom. Because of that, I'm able to show up more present with more clarity, with more joy, with more patience and grace for my children because I've poured into myself. And I think that's that's something that we miss a lot as parents yeah. or and, and not even intentionally. It's just it's it's so constant. The drain of being a parent is so constant. Yeah. And I know I think that inherently every parent wants to be better and they just don't always know how to do it. And then the focus just kind of continually goes outward and we lose sight of becoming better for ourselves so that we can be better for our children. So true. Yeah. I think walk more, right? As much daily activities you can accumulate throughout the day is good. Yeah. Get outside, even 10 minute walk by yourself, breathe through your nose and just upgrade the food. Like even if you're busy, like you'll have more energy and emotional regulation if you're eating healthier food. So it like actually will give you time and bandwidth is obviously we all feel the bandwidth struggle, but health gives you more bandwidth. There is a period. It might take you a couple of weeks to like get the clarity, buy the foods, change some things. But once that's rolling, it's helpful. It's not actually taking more time. And then if you can carve out the time for a couple workouts per week or doing some real self-care stuff, that's the next level. And you keep on building level through level. What would you say to somebody who's like, they're, they're listening to this, they're feeling motivated. They feel like this is something that could actually be within reach. You know, we talk about how much you mentioned earlier, like six to 12 months, just like completely change everything for them. But if they want to get started, like, what would you say, like you need to have in your mind this much time before you're really starting to feel things switch. So just like be committed to buckling down for this much yeah. time. In third, there's a, there is a 30 day period that is really, really pivotal. It's like exactly how a rocket shoots off. The rocket needs a shit ton of fuel to escape the early experience of gravity. So it builds up and it blasts off. It's a lot of energy, a lot of energy, a lot of energy, less energy, less energy, then it's up into orbit and it needs very little to course correct. Like the initial inertia of starting and changing takes a lot of time and, and energy. And I'd say not so sort of time, but like focused energy. And it's about 30 days to really feel like you have intrinsic motivation to kick in because in 30 days, if you have weight to lose, you can lose 10 pounds at a very reasonable, nice weight rate, and you'll feel lighter and a little more motivated. And then that intrinsic motivation kinds of kicks in. Um, I'd say like the first three months are, are quite pivotal as you build on that. And one of the ways we actually approach this in our program is our initial phase one of our program is a 30 day program working on writing the mission statement, getting you set up on the nutrition plan, starting daily walking, improving the hydration, and then sprinkling in some of these workouts to build that kind of initial energy and momentum. And those happen in layers. They may not all happen in the first 30 days, but you're building in this, in this realm. And it tends to be for people around the six months to one year, you start to truly have a shift in your, your neuro associations because you've had so many days, you've made decisions, you've drifted off track and come back on track where now you feel like you're like a different person. And you look back, you're like, man, I can't believe how trapped I used to be, what I thought like. That's when you have the psychology that actually feels like it's running a different software. So that's around the expectation of the period of time. So coming around New Year's, if this episode you're listening to this around January time, like get excited. Like you have a beautiful period of time. Like at the end of this year, like fast forward, you could literally feel like you're a completely different person physically, mentally, how, how connected you are. And, and like, that's the opportunity here. And it does like, like immersion, there's an immersive period. And here's what else I'll say. It helps when you're a busy parent and you have a lot of bandwidth that's being sucked in different directions, like decisions to make, taking care of everyone else, to not also have to be the one to figure out your exact health routine. Oh my gosh. Like, because like, because that's the rider on top of that elephant. The elephant's like, man, this is heavy. I'm feeling like kind of burnt out. And the rider's like, no, we got to go. But wait, I don't actually know what to do. So maybe we go here, maybe we go there. Like that's- And then then the elephant gets burnt out. And you have to sift through all this information. I totally (laughs) relate to that. For sure. And, that, and like, it's a non-starter, right? And then you also look at the greatest performers in any domain. They have coaches like Kobe Bryant had a shooting coach. Like he's probably better than his shooting coach, but he had a shooting coach because the shooting coach was like, hey, do this, try to make this tweak here. So that's what's really helpful for people to sink into something where you can just follow and execute. Like athletes execute on the plans that their coaches and their guides like do. If we can kind of get into that mind frame of like following something, it could be anything where you don't have to do as much thinking and you can just more like execute and work on the implementation. Oh, it's so helpful at taking that cognitive load off. 
That's incredible. Yeah. So I have another question that's similar to Natalie's. So, so let's say that someone's gotten to the point where they've, you know, gone past the, the, the gravity, uh, holding them down. They're the mm-hmm. rocket, they're in the orbit. Um, but you know, let's say that they're trying to lose weight and as you lose yep. weight, your, your BMR, your basal metabolic rate goes yeah. down and all, all of a sudden you hit this plateau of like, yep. I'm, this is my target goal of my weight. I am not losing weight anymore. How do you help people get through those plateaus? For sure. So there's a couple things that levers that are that are really helpful for helping people break through plateaus and just also understanding that weight loss is not linear. And you're right, it is like a curve that decreases over time, because you do lose basal metabolic rate partly, the body becomes a little less you know, wanting to lose the weight, especially as your fat stores decrease, this hormone called leptin decreases as well. One thing that we have found works really well is actually using strategic fasting and intermittent fasting to give these periodic signals for the body. It tends to really help break through plateaus. So one thing we do in in the second phase of our program, after they've kind of gotten into orbit is we introduce the habit of people doing uh, 24 hour fasts once per week, a dinner to dinner fast, a breakfast to breakfast fast. I just started incorporating these weekly. This is crazy. Yeah really, really good for, for longevity, for metabolic health, uh, for just understanding your own hunger and appetite cues for a little bit of discipline. And what it, what we really found is like the body responds differently to constant calorie restriction than it does to intermittent calorie restriction. And the latter seems to be a little helpful in helping people break through plateaus. So the dinner to dinner fast can be helpful. Um, we actually do help people like take necessarily like diet breaks where they might increase their calories a little bit or increase a free meal once in a while. And, and also changing up your workouts and focusing on muscle building through the process is massive because if you're losing weight and not also doing some of the strength training to build the muscle, the metabolism can go down. But the combination of new fresh workouts, some intermittent fasting, increasing hydration, and like also when people are not losing weight, oftentimes the system is in a, in a predominantly par- a sympathetic like stress state. So looking at the sleep variable is also a massive component. Um, when people get into like stress states, the body tends to lose weight less. So if you can actually work on creating more of that parasympathetic balance, weight tends to go off, but just even the grace of the frame again, that it's going to be periods of where you see a lot of results, but you still keep on carry on like those periods where you're not getting the perfect results all the time. Also test your face and your faith and perseverance. And like, there is literal benefit to those periods as well. Yeah, totally. You know, I was actually just thinking about my own personal experience over the last couple of months. I was working on on my body composition and I'm just like, I was checking my weight every week and I was noticing that the that the number wasn't going down. And I'm like, this is really interesting. But like when I look at pictures of myself, I'm noticing, well, Mm -hmm. I'm actually I feel like I look better. And so kind of what I eventually came to the realization of is like I'm putting on muscle mass, which weighs Mm -hmm. more than fat. And so I, I know that I'm losing fat and I'm and I'm gaining muscle. And so like I think that's also something important for people that are trying to lose weight that the number on the scale isn't everything Mm -hmm. like that's just one aspect, you know, uh, in many other aspects that really define your health that we've talked about during this podcast as well. I'd like to comment on that because I think the, the idea of using certain measuring sticks is a really, really important part of the process. Like this is part of like my philosophy and the philosophy we have in the program. We actually encourage people in the beginning part of the program to weigh themselves every single day. And I want to explain this because it might seem a little counterintuitive to what you may have heard. The point is not to see your weight go down every single day. The point is to get more data and feedback on how your body's responding to your habits and your foods is actually a learning mechanism. Because what you find is that uh, your body oftentimes holds on to water or your digestive system is a little more sluggish. If you ate a certain thing or you missed a little bit of sleep and you're getting this data feedback points. And as you go further in your journey, you may not wait every single day. It may just be like a check-in once a week, every couple of days. Um, and, and, but also you're incorporating, as you said, other measuring sticks and components to give you motivation and feedback that you're on track. This could be things like blood work. This could be things like photos or tape measure. This could be some kind of like body scan machine that you have in your house. This can also be workout performance, which tends to be an ever increasing uh, metric that's really good to kind of work work with. It could be consistency metrics of like not breaking the chain of, of, of how consistent you are, but having many measuring sticks are really, really important, especially when the weight loss does tend to slow down. But giving yourself the gift, if you're looking at true losing weight. Like it's a, it's a Peter Drucker quote, this management executive guy. It's like what gets measured in track gets improved. And so keeping that kind of top of mind is, is helpful for feedback. And again, it's not that it goes down every day, but it gives you data and insight because sometimes you'll be like, Oh man, I had a, I had a free meal and I ate sushi. And then the next day I'm up three, four pounds. It's like, obviously you didn't gain three, four pounds, of fat, <laughs> but you did just have a shit ton of sodium and carbohydrates and you're holding water and you probably need to have a nice big poop. 
And so, <laughs> right? <laughs> and that's valuable and you learn. Like you learn something from your body by even seeing just the weight metric. And it's primarily going to be in the water retention uh, area of things. And, and that's valuable info. That's amazing. Um, okay. I, we're coming kind of close to the end of our time, but I'm wondering if you would be willing to share maybe one of your favorite success stories with us from one of your clients. For sure. I'll, I'll share, I'll share two of them. One from the fit father side, one for the fit mother. Uh, one that really gets me is, is this guy named Steven Alexander. He's 54 years old. Um, he's one of our program members where he started off, you know, as a busy dad doing things, he has two daughters and he started the program wearing 390 pounds. And I like Steven's story because like most people listening to this who want to improve their health probably don't have nearly as much of a hole as they were in as Steven. And, you know, it's just like he didn't get there overnight. He was, you know, big as a kid, but then he got, you know, the mental emotional stuff of not feeling confident in his own skin. And he stacked that up to the point where he was literally like his doctor's like, dude, you're probably going to die soon ish if you don't turn this around. And like he had his kind of wake up call and in 18 months. Steven lost 192 pounds wow. and he did this through the exact stuff that we're talking about. Yes. He did strength training two, three times a week. He walked every single day. He drank water, but he just stayed consistent. And I think it's like so cool because he literally started running half marathons with his oldest daughter, 18 months after being That's, almost 400 pounds. That's incredible. Right. So like what's possible for us, right? It, it's amazing what we can do and change in a short period of time. And he's a completely different guy. Um, from the women's side, man, we have a, we have somebody named Diana Diane O'Brien. She's sixty one, so post menopause, struggling with the hormonal aspect of it, and she was kind of just in this general rut of having gained weight. She runs a flower shop up in Northern California, and she was in this routine of like every night after closing up the flower shop, she'd go down the street to a local wine bar, and the second she walked in, they started pouring her her regular glass. They knew exactly what she was having, and and you know, and then you know, she just kept on gaining weight, not sleeping well, not feeling good feeling out of alignment. And, and she was able in the context of, I think, six months, but she's been with us for, for years since this time to get rid of all her prescription medications. She was on pre-diabetic medication, blood sugar medication. She has biceps now at 61 years old. Fitness is now an outlet for her. She gets a glass of wine once a week still, but it's not an e everyday thing that's pulling her and keeping her trapped. So I like her story too, because old ladies can absolutely crush it. And she's not even old. She's 61 years young. It's like, it's kind of a mindset, but she can, she can make this amazing transformation and have biceps at this age and break free of our own habits and, and decisions. And obviously for her, it's more than just physical. Like certainly the fact that, you know, she, she feels and looks better, but it's, she broke free from some stuff that was trapping her and shorter a new trajectory for her back half part of life. Like that's so inspiring to me. That is incredible. Thank you for sharing those stories. I love hearing yeah. that. Um, okay. So for people that are listening and they're feeling as pumped up as we are, um, what's the first step? How do they find you? Well, if you're actually interested in going through our methodology that we've had, we have our two programs and websites, fitfatherproject.com. So fitfatherproject as it sounds and fitmotherproject.com. On those websites, we have all of our case stories uh, and case study success stories. We have free meal plans and workouts that we'll send to your email and you can join our newsletter, which is a great time because especially around the holidays and seasonally, we have some really great deals on our programs because we want to invite people in to experience all this stuff firsthand. If you're super jazzed up and you just want to join the program, they're going to be on the websites. And if you just want to learn more and maybe connect deeper with the philosophies that I share and just get a bunch of training, our YouTube channels are amazing resources. I mean, between the two channels, Fit Follower, Fit Mother, we have over a million subscribers and close to a thousand videos. So there is endless resources here for you to get into nutrition, exact workouts that we follow. Cause we didn't talk about exercise too much due to time, but we have workouts geared for people over 40. They're joint friendly, time efficient. All of those are on YouTube as well. So you can find us there. I will say, I think it's kind of interesting, um, because I've before done the thing where I like go online and buy somebody's program, whatever, download it. And it sounds to me like what you do is so different because normally when you do that, they just send you a meal plan and they send you the workouts yeah. and that's it. And you're done. And I get these meal plans and I'm like, I'm not eating that. That's just like, even if I, <laughs> exactly. even when they started to break it down more and it's like paleo, keto, vegan, like which one are they? And I'm like, well, let's do keto. And I'm still like, Ugh. like I'm a good cook and we I'm a foodie. want you to eat these micro green. But, no. Or <laughs> Sure. You know, it's just, and then it's yeah, like, well, yeah. I just paid the, okay, well, let's get to the workout and the workout's like, oh, it's okay. You know, whatever. But then it's like, well, what if I did this is, or I have this injury, you know, and there's no, there's no follow up, There's no support. And it sounds to me like what you're doing at fit father and fit mother is the opposite of that. It's hands on, sure. it's custom. It's how do we make this work for you? And I think that's incredible and exciting. 
we have a team of 20 people that literally are dedicated to strictly like helping all of our members that come in. Like we message you, everything's on an app and web and mobile. So we, it's a process of actually going through step by step, not like just handing you any PDF. It's all super immersive. It's a learning journey. We keep you accountable and you get access to our community of all the dads and moms who are on the program too, which is probably one of the best benefits because you can draw so much inspiration from that and connect with us. Like you become a part of our family. So that's, that's how we roll. Cause you become that's like awesome. what you surround yourself with. That yeah. was always a tip yeah. that I I gave people that were trying to get healthier is I'm like, first thing I want you to do is go to Instagram and find like five health and fitness nutrition people to follow and start liking their stuff. So more because then it's just really about what you're seeing yeah. and what's repeating and all of that. So I think that's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Anthony, it's been an absolute pleasure having mm -hmm. you on. And let me just say, uh, I think that the work that you're doing is, um, how can I say life changing? It's, yeah. and I, I think it's such an amazing legacy that you're not just leaving for your kids, but leaving for the world. So thank you so much for the work that you're doing and for the, for the amazing things that you're putting out into the world. Thank you both. I really enjoyed our time together. Oh, us too. We'd love to have you back on sometime.